back, everybody. My name is Susan Lawson. I'm one of the partners here at the Rawson Law Firm. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today I am going to talk about Wadir and trial. And I know you heard from my partners, Mehdi and then Adam, and they talked about a lot of the stuff that would happen pre-trial. We're gonna get into today the stuff that's gonna happen once you're set for trial. So I'm gonna get into, uh, speak to you guys today about getting the jury on your side uh, from the start of the case and cross-examining the victim. So again, this is me, Susan Lawson. I'm a board certified criminal trial attorney. Um, I've spent most of my career practicing in South Florida, particularly in Broward County. However, I have also uh, practiced in the state of Maryland and the So the first thing I wanted to talk to you all about is uh, voir dire. So the questionnaire, a lot of times it depends on, uh, in Florida I know, what jurisdiction you're in, what circuit you're in, if the judge you're in front of would allow you to submit to the prospective panel questions. So we've done this here and it's really on a case by case basis on a judge by judge basis. In a lot of our capital cases, which as you know, sex crimes can be capital sexual battery cases. Um, it's a good idea. I recommend that ahead of time you file motions asking the judge to uh, allow the prospective panel to fill out a questionnaire. And some, these are just some questions that you uh, could put. And, you know, a lot of times we'll go back and forth. We'll have a hearing, uh, a pretrial hearing with the judge in the state, and we'll put together a questionnaire for the prospective panel. Um, and, and the reason why it's so helpful to do that is because you get to know a lot about the prospective panel before you even get up and speak to them. So some of the questions that I've used before I put together on, on these slides, uh, you, could, you could ask, because we do you know what is considered sexual abuse or sexual assault? Have you been a victim of sexual abuse or violence? A lot of times that that is a question that we do get to know ahead of time. When, how old you how old were you? Was it in Florida, the US? Where did this occur? Um, was the matter reported by to authorities? By whom? If not re reported, was that your decision? Was there a trial or was a court involved? How was the matter concluded? Did you give a statement or more than one statement about the matter and to whom? These are very specific. Um, I have not had great success in getting approved by the judge. All these detailed questions are normally more general, but certainly I would recommend trying to uh, allow the judge to grant you permission to ask these questions to the prospective panel ahead of time. Some more questions uh, that you could submit as proposed questions for um, the panel is if this matter was handled by law enforcement and went to court, how do you feel about the matter, the way the matter was handled? Is this event something that you would think would be influenced by if selected as a juror in this case, or is this something you believe you can set aside? Again, in jury selection, what are we looking for? We're looking for jurors that can be fair and impartial in this case. Um, for either answer, how can you be sure? Has anyone close to you been a victim of sexual abuse or violence? That's very important. How do you know? Um, regardless of the source of your understanding of what happened to your friend, loved one, what, would you, what you learned happened to be something that would negatively impact your ability, again, be fair and impartial during the case. How do, how do you or someone close to you, has they ever been accused of sexual violence? How do you feel about this? Do you believe that this will negatively impact your ability to be fair and impartial? So getting those questions answered ahead of time um, is really helpful, and I recommend you doing that. So for Dyer, so you always have to start out by addressing the elephant in the room. And I, and I put this picture, and I realized when I put this picture, I kind of, it's, it's more of a mammoth, uh, not really an elephant, but this was taken, I don't know if you, any of you have been to the La Brea Tar Pits Museum in uh, Los Angeles, but that's where this picture was taken from. So when you're addressing the elephant in the room, how do you do that? So 
you you know you start out you heard ladies and gentlemen that mr john doe is charged with sexual battery of a child and you let them know you let the jury the panel know that uh we're going to talk a lot about things that are very uncomfortable as you know what dire is the most important part in uh the trial process because the individuals that you end up on your panel are going to be deciding the ultimately guilty or not guilty in this case and in particular in sex cases um, it's very very important that you address right away the charge recognize that you know because you want to you know build a relationship with the panel that you know that this is um, uncomfortable for most people to talk about and then you you get into after you say the charge um, address the the issue as far as most people don't feel comfortable talking about those words you know anal sex those are uncomfortable things for people to want to talk about and their experiences but you have to let them know that you know you recognize that it's uncomfortable you recognize that each and every one of those individuals walk into that jury the jury room and walk into the courtroom and you don't expect them to leave their personal experiences, you know, at the door. That's not realistic. Uh, so you need to find out. It's information gathering. Adam was talking about in the pre-investigation, getting as much information as possible. That's what we wanted. That's the goal in Vaudeer, that we want to get as much information as possible about these prospective members of the jury. because. We don't know much about them. Maybe perhaps if you get uh, what I was just talking about, if you get granted uh, the questionnaire and know a little bit, but we want to really dig deep. Uh, so, and the reason why we want to dig deep, because we, we need to know if these are people, obviously we want sitting on our panel. A lot of times in these sex cases in particular, you know, people will say, and you, you'll get them to say, hopefully, this isn't the case for me. I would rather be sitting in a murder case than sitting on a sex case. But those are things you need to know. So after you address the charge and the, the, that it's uncomfortable, the next thing um, I always ask is just a general question. Does anyone here, just by hearing that this is a sexual battery of a child, this is a lewd and lascivious molestation, just by hearing the nature of the charge, um, does anyone feel they may not, may not be fair and impartial? And normally in these type of cases, you get a lot of ha hands raised, right? And then it's important that you address, you know, go take your time, go slow, talk to each one of these uh, prospective members of the panel and find out, you know, do they feel uncomfortable just by hearing the nature of the charge? And in these type of cases, you're going to get a lot of cause challenges. And as we know, you know, a lot of cause challenges is unlimited. The number, you know, I've had in many of doing many of these cases, I've had to, um, because I've been granted so many cause challenges, you know, had to bust the panel, wasn't able to get a panel, but that's okay. Um, we want to, that's good. We want to, we want to get those cause challenges. Um, and I cited a case here, which you can see, Alt B State, that says the Florida Supreme Court has emphasized that a juror must be excused for cause if any, any reasonable doubt exists as to whether the juror possesses, possesses an impartial state of mind. Another thing that's really important to talk about the panel, sympathy, right? And especially in these sex cases. Um, again, recognize and sympathize the, sens the sensitive nature of the charge, but make sure each juror knows and when, you know, at the end when the judge is giving the rules for deliberation, this is in the rules for deliberation, but make sure each juror knows that this case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or because you are angry at anyone. Um, and then follow up. Can every, does everyone understand that? Um, is there, can everybody follow the law? And, you know, a lot of times you'll see people who, you know, don't want to speak in front of their new crowd of best friends. So 
they're quiet. They're just sitting there. Um, so at the same time, it's always we up here at the Roth and Law Firm, if we're going to trial, especially on all our cases, but especially these type of cases, um, we, we always have at least two of us from the firm sitting on the trial. And so if I'm focused on, you know, this part of the panel, I'll have my partner, you know, watching the body language. The body language can tell a lot, uh, especially when the charge is read. So if people aren't being forthcoming on the panel, you know, we're always watching for those eager beavers, we call them, head shaking, body language, because words obviously can tell you a lot, but so can um, someone's body language and how they're presenting themselves. And, and, you know, you can't be afraid to, if they're not, you know, and I recommend you need to talk to each one of these people. Um, on your perspective panel. And, you know, it's okay to say, hey, Mary, it looks like you may be a little uncomfortable. Um, you know, is, is there anything that, you know, you, you've been thinking about that, you know, this is my only opportunity to speak to you uh, that's bothering you? Are you okay with the charge? Can you follow the law that you can't, you're going to, you may hear from um, a young child, and you and you can't uh, feel we it's we can't ask you to put your uh, emotions aside and again leave them at the front door. Door, but do you understand that this case can't be decided for someone because you feel sorry for them? Are you able to follow that law? So again, speaking to the prospective panel. You know, you're going to get a lot of parents, um, a, a lot of grandparents. So speak directly to parents, especially those that ha have children or grandchildren that are the same age. You know, you have a sex case where the alleged victim is eight years old, right? The last thing you want is to find to have one of someone sitting on your panel and then to later learn after it's too late that, you know, they had it, they had it have the same age child. They have an eight year old child, the alleged victims, eight years old and the victim reminds them of their own child. Uh, that can become a serious issue. So, and by the questions you ask to figure this out is, you know, you, you, you have to harp on, can each one of you look at, Mr. John, right now and say he is innocent. And if you, if you can't, that's okay, but we need to know. I always, when I get up there to, to speak to the panel, um, I always tell them, you know, the more you talk, the quicker I'll be, but you really, really have to take your time um, and methodically talk to these individuals find out as much information as you can. But I do say that, and sometimes that helps them um, start talking more. So, you know, ask them, can you go home every night and have dinner with your kids? Address that, you know, this is a, this is a case. These cases normally take a week, two weeks. I've been in one that's been, you know, much longer, a month. Um, is, is that okay? Are you going to be Are you going to be able to focus on and give this case your undivided attention, or are you going to be thinking about you know picking up your kid at school and all the other responsibilities you have? Do you understand that you can't go if you are selected on this panel that you can't go home at night and talk to this case about this case with your partner? Uh, are, is, I'm sure you're going to want to talk, but the law says you can't. Are you going to be able to follow that? Can you go home every night and still maintain that Mr. John is an innocent person until proven guilty? You know, I, and when I'm reading the chart, when the charges are read and I'm speaking and I said, I always ask the prospective panel, how many of you walked in here, saw Mr. John sitting next to me and thought, what did he do? Right? That's, that's the natural reaction. But that's not what you should be doing here. It's not what did he do, it's what can the state prove? Uh, what if you think he did do it? 
but the state has not overcome that high burden, that burden of each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. So can you still find him guilty and go, not guilty and go home to your children after? And again, you have to let them know if you can't, it's okay. We recognize um, this is very difficult. So it's important to get the panel to obviously like you and to get as much information from them. So this picture makes me laugh that the little girl taking cookies out of the cookie jar, but um, you know, you have to have to speak to each juror individually um, and, and see, cause I, kids lie, right? So you have to talk to them and ask them, do you think a child can make up a story about being molested or raped? And some people will say no, that they don't think a child can make that up, that if a child comes in, and in a lot of these sex cases, there's no corroboration. We just had the state just has a child. There's no witnesses. Um, we're going to get into it. Sometimes there's DNA, but sometimes there's not. So a lot of times they just have the the child and that's you want to know on this perspective panel um, is do you believe that a child can make up a story specifically about being molested um, and again this is what I was talking about just a few minutes ago for parents make sure you you follow up with will you look at the victim in this case testifying and is there a chance that maybe you know, he or she will remind you of your own child. Uh, and then I added these cases, the case law that, you know, it's very important to remember that you are allowed to voir dire there on uh, your specific defense. So, and it's uh, an error, the judge has to allow you. And I cited these, uh, the known cases of Lovato and Mosley, that it's an error for the judge to not allow you to do that. So, and, and when we're, when you're picking a panel, you know, make sure you, uh, when you're going through, make sure you make your proper objections, make sure you renew your objections, uh, make sure at the end, you know, you ask for more strikes and then refuse to accept the panel for appellate purposes. So here we're talking about DNA. And again, during voir dire, this is very, very important to address, especially um, if you know, and you'll know through discovery, if DNA is an issue in your case. So it's very important um, to let the panel know that it is not infallible, um, and it is interpretations made by someone who will testify, and that, that the panel will have to judge their credibility. So a lot of times, and I know this is kind of hard to see, but I put this, this is one of a, a case that uh, we've had, you get in discovery, you get a DNA report and right, it's comparing, um, you know, where they, where they got someone's DNA um, and then the results. And a lot of times, you know, someone, an expert will come in, right? And say, one in one million, Mr. John Doe's DNA. So talking about the credibility of DNA when you're selecting a jury, talking to them about that is extremely important. And how, how do we talk to a panel about someone's credibility? Some of the questions I ask when talking about someone's credibility is, do you believe that people who are called by the state and take the witness stand always tell the truth? Now, and then I'll address defendant testifying or not testifying. Now, if John Doe does testify, will you disbelieve him simply because he is charged with this crime? And I let, the, let them know that they're the sole judge of credibility and that they can believe all, some, or none. Um, and then I'll go into, you know, some of the things that ways you can judge credibility. Do the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Sometimes depend, I'll get into how many lives does it take for you not to trust someone? Um, but it is very important to address credibility, especially when you have DNA. I recommend doing it all the time, but especially when you have DNA, because you do not want this uh, expert witness or 
coming in and, and saying these numbers and then they turn the ears off already. So Betty, I know she started the presentation and she spent a lot of time um, speaking about William's role and a lot of time can be spent, um, probably a whole presentation on William's role. Um, but, and so William's role is similar fact evidence of other crimes, but it's so important in Wadir to talk about William's role. So prior to trial, as many talked about, you know, you, the state files their notice of intent, you file your objection, you have a hearing. And, you know, these, it's very hard to um, exclude a lot of times the Williams rule evidence. So if you'll know ahead of time, if hopefully ahead of time, um, if the Williams rule evidence is coming into your case, because one time we had the situation where the judge tried to say, oh, no, 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 after, after we pick the jury, then we'll have the Williams rule hearing. No, you need the Re Williams rule hearing held prior to trial, obviously, so you can properly prepare, right? So you need to address with the prospective panel because they're going to be confused and, the, you know, you have to tell them this is an odd issue that they will hear from witnesses not listed in this case. Say what? Um, and if you believe that a witness is telling you the truth about that case, um, but you think the victim in this case is not telling the truth, you need to find out. Can you still find him not guilty? Uh, meaning they believe the, the person, the victim in the other case, but they don't believe the victim in this case. They must find your client not guilty, um, which is very hard because a lot of times if, if that happens, they'll think, they'll think, oh, well, I believe her. So I'm going to find her guilty, even though that we're not talking about the same case. So that's very and spend time going through this. It's very, very important. Um, and, and instruct them, let them know, even if you believe the witness was molested, uh, the witness, you must find not guilty. And I would go through, ask each and every member of that prospective panel, can they follow that law? And if there's any hesitation, follow up. Uh, I see you hesitated. Can you, you know, ask them, ask them to elaborate on that hesitation. But again, in sex cases, Williams rule evidence explaining to them that you may hear another witness come in that's unrelated to this case. You need to explain that and address that. And even if they believe that witness, but they don't believe the victim in this case, you have to reinforce that they must, they must find your client not guilty. So we've been, I, and you know, not all sex cases are obviously dealing with children, but that's, we've been focusing on that really today. So, um, it's important to, to re recognize the law as far as child witnesses, that the competence of a child witness is based on intelligence, not age, and whether the child possesses a sense of obligation to tell the truth. So as we all know, um, you know, I have a, I have a six-year-old child and, and a nine-year-old child. My six-year-old child acts like he's uh, nine year, like he's my nine year old's age. Uh, so again, it's not the age uh, that matters. It's based on the intelligence um, and whether the, and this is something that has to be determined prior. Um, and I know Maddie talked about child hearsay, but that it's, it's the intelligence, not the age. So when ruling on a child's competency to testify, the, tri the trial court should consider whether the child is capable of observing and recollecting facts, and whether the child is capable of narrating those facts to the court or to a jury, and whether the child has a moral sense of the obligation to tell the truth. And so again, this is all stuff that um, prior to a child testifying, obviously you need to address in jury selection, the, the child testifying, but the confidence of a child needs to be addressed uh, prior to trial. 
And in making the competency determination, the child may base its determination on its own examination of the child or an attorney's examination of the child. The court may also consider expert testimony and reports in fulfilling its duty to determine competency. And I cited a case there. And this is very important. Failure to adequately uh, to, to conduct a competency evaluation on a child victim can lead to reversible error. Um, and for in Florida, Fry remains the standard, not Daubert. Okay, so you're, you know, there is there is so much I could cover as far as um, Vadir. It's so important. It's so uh, you know critical that again, you reiterate, you get them to like you, you you sympathize with them that this is uncomfortable, and you try to get as much information at, from each prospective juror for those cause challenges. So once you have that panel, once you're done with doing the strikes and you have the panel um, and they're seated, uh, I'm, the next topic I'm going to get into is cross examination of a child victim. And I have this picture here of this little girl holding this teddy bear. And this has happened to me before um, in front of, in, in a case where a little girl got on the witness stand, um, brought her little teddy bear and sat there like, just like that, holding the bear. Had, had children come in with dogs. Um, you need to try to you know, address that before the child comes in holding the teddy bear because how uh, prejudicial is that for you, right? Um, like you see that, you don't need to hear anything else. So make sure, make sure when a child is testifying in trial, they don't come to court with a teddy bear. A lot of times the victim advocates give them these teddy bears or something um, that they don't have that while they're testifying. So cross-examination of a child victim. So this is really more fact specific. So you have to use your own judgment when preparing to cross-examine a victim ahead of time. So it's really important to, you know, if there's a delay in reporting or if it was reported right away. So, and also the age of the child. So if there is a delay in reporting and the child is now older, you can go harder on them. Harder on them than like if the last slide like that. Um, you can question them in cross examination. Why didn't you tell anyone this before? And then you go through, methodically go through in your questioning, you know, all the opportunities they had to report this before. You know, you report this to anyone at school. Did you report this to your um, guidance counselor at school? to your principal, to your assistant principal, anybody at school. You know, you, a lot of times these children have gone through custody hearings. Did, did this ever come out? Did you ever tell anybody in a custody hearing? Um, did you report this to any of your friends? And if the answer is no, then why now are you just choosing to report this? So, it's very important that you go through in detail and, and you'll know that obviously been preparing your case, the answers to these questions ahead of time through the discovery process and taking <clears throat> the deposition of the, ch the child, which Adam talked about, which is very important, but you'll know the answers. And if they didn't report these and it's an older child, I encourage you um, to go hard on them as to why they didn't report it and why now are they just reporting it. So if they didn't report, but mom found out, right? Um, how did mom find out? So I had a case where mom found presents from a client, right? They, and cell phone, chips, the, our, the client had bought her kid different things. Um, you know, it's, it's when you're cross-examining the child, suggest that the child didn't want to get into trouble because maybe someone else gave it to them. Um, you know, the mom confronts the child and, and the child's protecting somebody and blames your client, right? 
also a lot of times, you know, parents find out that their child has sex and confronts their child. And, you know, same thing. The child doesn't want to get, get whoever they had sex with in trouble. So what do they do? They conveniently um, blame your client. And again, do not be afraid to impeach. So impeachment is so big because obviously that's how, um, you know, when the jurors go back and to weigh the evidence, that's one of the big things in weighing the evidence is, is impeachment. So don't be afraid just because the, the person on the stand is a child to, to impeach them, right? And hopefully by the time you're getting to trial and you're cross-examining the child, you know, you have the prior statements, you have what they are, the statement that they uh, originally gave at the sexual assault treatment center. Then you took the deposition of the child. So you have two prior statements of the child. And then now they're taking the stand. You know, make sure you have, I always have my, um, my prior statements tabbed up, highlighted, written the pages. So, you know, but don't be afraid to go back and impeach if they're saying something different. And most of the time, they are saying something different, right? Um, because like I always say, it's easy to remember uh, the truth, but hard to remember lies. And, and, you know, the reality is in a lot of these sex cases, the child or the victim is lying. So uh, this is a slide just on impeachment. And, um, you know, again, a party may attack or support the credibility of a witness, a victim, or the accused by evidence in the form of reputation evidence, except that. The evidence may refer only to character relating to truthfulness. Evidence of truthful character is admissible only after the character of the witness for truthfulness has been attacked by reputation evidence, and that's under Florida Statute 90.06609. However, any witness may have their truthfulness impeached uh, for being convicted of a felony or dishonesty or a false statement. That's under 90.610. Reputation evidence relating to a victim's prior sexual conduct or evidence presented for the purposes of showing that that manner of dress of the victim at the time of the offense in sight of the sexual battery shall not be admitted into evidence in the sexual battery case. Further specific instances of prior consensual sexual activity between the victim and any person other than the offender also shall not be admitted into evidence in a sexual battery case, except for specific enumerated rated reasons after that that's something you would have to deal with in camera prior so we were just discussing if a child either you know does not report or delayed reporting so what do you do and if the child was older but so what do you do if a child reported right away or is very young so, right, you have to, know, have to know what you're dealing with here. So, in this situation, instead of going harsh, you need to go easy because no juror is going to like you if you have that little girl sitting on the stand and you're going harsh on her. So, go easy. And normally, um, in this situation, their testimony is usually pretty short, right? Because the state will rely on the child hearsay, which we already discussed, or, or other evidence. So what do you do? You focus on your specific defense. So in a recent trial, we focused on the specific timeline the child gave to police because it didn't match up when the sex had to occur for pregnancy. So this is all stuff you obviously you're going to learn prior to trial, but in cross-examining the child, it's very important um, to, you know, that's, that's how you can get a great, do a great cross on a young child or, or a child that reported right away. You know, oh yeah, yeah, sure, the state focuses, you reported right away, you reported right away, but uh, this timeline doesn't add up. And, and go through the timeline that you created, right? So, uh, ask them about, go into the attention they got as a result of this accusation, you know. Ask, ask them who they've spoken to about this case. Ask them, you know, did your mom give you anything? Did your mom take you to Disney World? Um, it, it all goes to, uh, you know, the truthfulness 
of, of the child. And as we know, as an as I've already stated, kids lie. So a lot of, you know, hopefully you, you get by picking the jury, you get uh, per, people on your panel that recognize kids lie and recognize through your great uh, idea, recognize that not only do um, kids lie in general, but kids do lie about being sexually molested um, or raped. So the fact that, that you have these people hopefully on your jury, so that make sure you um, ask this child who reported right away or who is very young, ask them about the attention um, they got as a result of this accusation. So, cause many times children make things up because as we know, they want attention, right? So, you know, they say, uh, you know, they think it's going to be helpful. They say something they to the, to their mom, not realizing that, you know, that what they tell their mom or dad is then going to be reported to the police. And then it turns into this whole investigation and they feel like that they have to stick with their lie. Um, you know, once they, a lot of times, you know, police, once police in, get involved, the child feels like it is too late to take it back. So cross-examination, you know, of a, of a child victim, I, I highly recommend, obviously, that it's really important to recognize if it was reported, when it was reported, um, the child's age, if they're very young, if they're older, and and not only frame your questions, but frame your plan of attack based on that. Uh, and as far as, you know, you can go into, don't be afraid, just because um, the you're cross-examining a young child, you know, don't be afraid to get into the the details and and to really cross examine them I, I don't I recommend obviously you do cross examine them um, and you know all these ways are cross examination again a lot of times as I said in these cases there is no corroboration so the state thinks say you know that by calling the alleged victim who is a child um, that they can that's all they need and a lot of times you know it obviously it can be all they need but how do you win your case how do, how do you win these cases, these difficult cases? Um, Cross-examining that child is key. Um, and you know, once once you're done cross-examining the victim, the victim in this case, my opinion, second uh, most important part of a trial, my favorite uh, between uh, Vadir and 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 I love closing. So. You know, it's great too when you have your a partner sitting with you taking notes. Um, I love when you get the opportunity to, you know, break for the day and prepare your closing for the next day um, because everything, the impeachment of that child, every single time you impeach that child, the, the, the amount of times they said, no, I didn't report it to anyone at school. No, I didn't report it to any one of my friends. All of that stuff. So all of that great information that you get from cross-examining the child, you got to tie that all into your closing argument. And, and, you know, I really recommend be detailed as possible in your closing argument. Um, but all this great information that you get through the questioning and your cross-examination of, of the child, you tie that and you hammer it home. Um, and you bring that all in, into your closing. So as far as uh, your closing, so right, we talked about if you're dealing with a very young child at closing, uh, you don't want to vilify the child, but you can say, you know, I don't know why they made it up. Maybe they made it up for attention. Uh, maybe someone put it in their head, but it is not our job to tell you the reason they told this story, right? This fabrication. And then, you know, we know it can't be true because of X, Y, and Z. We know it can't be true because of the timeline you presented in your cross-examination. 
Um, and in your closing, again, be very, very detailed. I, something I always love to say in my closing arguments are, ladies and gentlemen, you know, you go through the different ways reasonable doubt can arise, the evidence, conflicts of the evidence, or the lack of evidence, right? So obviously, reasonable doubt is a huge thing to address in closing argument. Um, a lot of times, I think it's really, um, really beneficial to read the reasonable doubt uh, jury instruction because it's great when they not only hear it from you, then they hear it from the judge, and then they get the packet to bring back with them. Um, but I love to say, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this case, you will have more questions than answers. And more questions than answers, that equals reasonable doubt. And another thing I like to add, um, obviously tie the facts and the great things you got out of your cross-examination into your closing, um, but I love to say, you know, probably guilty, not enough. Possibly guilty, not enough, you know, and really hammer that reasonable doubt because when you're picking the jury, you're gonna tell them, you know, as we all know, you, you let them know that when you're picking the jury, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to go back in the jury room right now, what would your verdict have to be? And at the time, you know, you have to be not guilty because you haven't heard any evidence and he's presumed innocent. So make sure that, and especially in these sex cases, um, and especially in uh, dealing with sex cases that are involving young children, um, Again, you don't want to turn off the, the panel by vilifying the child, um, but, but you can again say, we don't, it's not our burden to prove to you, you know, why this child made it up. You know, it, it's, there's a variety of reasons why the child could made it, made it up. Um, it's not our job to tell you that, you know, the, it's, the state hasn't met their burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, that this happened and the reason why it can't be true. And really, um, you know, I encourage when you're doing your closing argument, obviously be passionate, make eye contact with each and every uh, member of the prospective panel um, and through your great, you know, pretrial motions, dealing with, you know, the Williams rule, dealing with um, addressing that in your jury selection, addressing everything we've spoken about, doing that amazing cross-examination and then hammering it home in closing. Um, I feel confident that, you know, these cases, although they are hard, they are winnable and you will get the jury on your side. So I don't see any questions, um, but I wanted to, I wanted to thank you all. Um, this is my contact information. I would love, I, you know, we've done many of these type of cases. If you need help uh, in preparing uh, cases for trial, um, questions for voir dire, questions for cross-examination, just anything related to a trial, um, this is my information. Feel free to reach out and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.